Amen. It is great to be able to worship together about the God of Calvary, reminding us of what he has done for each and every one of us. One of the things that I want to do to just share with you today is to continue in this journey of what it means to engage others in our relationship with Christ. As you know, we've been talking about engaging Jesus and what that means for each and every one of us as we absorb all that God has to pour into our lives. And as we begin to talk about that and experience that together, we know that there is an outflow of what is within us. What's inside you is going to come out in some shape or form as you experience life and journey together. And so if we focus upon engaging others for Jesus Christ, then that's going to change how we see other people, how we interact with other people, and how we respond to people. And one of the things that we have been challenge that we've introduced to each and every one of us is the 3151 challenge where we are going to pray for three people. We're going to learn one method of sharing our faith and our testimony with other people. We're going to invite five people to Sunday school to worship throughout this summer, and we're going to share with one person. Now, if you don't think that you can have that opportunity to be able to engage others, then what we need to do is to consider what God has called each and every one of us to do. Because if we are to be a true reflection of who Christ is, that is what he did for each and every one of us. I want to ask you this question as we begin to look at this in the time that we have remaining today. What happens when you make a hole-in-one on a golf course and no one sees it? What happens if you were to make a hole-in-one and nobody else saw it? Would that not just... In fact, they call that a golfer's nightmare. The worst thing that they could ever experience. I've never had that opportunity or privilege to be able to experience a hole-in-one. Has anybody ever hit a hole-in-one? I'm just curious. Anybody? Somebody has. Two people have. How many... 25? Now remember, you're in church. (laughs) Do what? How many? Really? Eight hole in ones? Been lucky. (laughs) That's an amazing. Did people witness all eight of those? Okay, good. Then we're good. All right. We know some people say they don't count if no one. uh, I actually looked this up. You know me, I Googled it. And and because um, we can trust everything on the internet, and so what that said is that technically there is not a rule that says that you cannot mark a hole in one if no one else sees it because the golf is supposed to be the game of integrity. So whatever score you put down there is the one that is registered. Now some people will debate that, and there's a lot of talk. Just Google it. There's a lot of talk about that. Hole in one. But what happens if you were to hit a hole in one and nobody else experienced that? Nobody else saw it. Nobody else was there to witness this great thing that you have done. That would just stink. I mean, it would be the worst feeling to be able to say that you just accomplished this great thing and nobody else was able to see it. Well, let me ask you this. What's greater in your life? To be able to have the freedom from your sin and experience eternity with your creator or a hole in one. Now, you're saying, now, pastor, that doesn't even compare. Now, some of you may think, well, you know, hole in one because you might be able to win something. If you're in a tournament or a game and they have some car or some money or some vacation to Hawaii and you hit a hole in one, well, there's some benefit to that. But let me ask you this. If you've experienced something incredible like a hole in one, don't you want to share that? Because let me ask you, if you've ever caught a fish that is beyond the excitement of catching the biggest fish you've ever caught, what are you going to do? You're going to take a picture of it. You're going to share it. You're going to post it. You're going to talk about it. You're going to let people experience what you've experienced. Folks, when we come to understanding what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, it goes beyond even making a hole in one. And yet sometimes we do not take the opportunity to share what God has done for us. 
Sometimes we think we don't have the ability to be able to communicate what God has done for us, and that's the most amazing thing that can happen in your life. But why is it that we do not want to share this incredible thing that's happened for us that God has given us in the gift of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he died for our sins in our place, and he rose again so that we may be able to experience not just forgiveness of our sin, but redemption of our sin through the life that he has given us. That's what I want us to share about today. In Romans chapter 1 verse 16 it says this, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from the first to the last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Now, an important part about these words that the Apostle Paul gives us is he's, again, writing to early believers so that they would understand this new life that they have been given. The idea that in verse 17 it says, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Why is it that we should share what we have through Jesus Christ? Because it is the gospel and it's through the gospel that this righteousness is revealed. You know, it's nothing that we do. Let me just say that again. It's nothing that we do that brings us to salvation. It is in this gospel that we're talking about that the righteousness of God is revealed. This righteousness, not because we just live right, it is the righteousness of the gospel. What is the gospel? If righteousness is found in the gospel, what's this gospel that we're talking about? It's what Jesus Christ has done for us. It's the story the experience that we have through Jesus Christ of accepting what he's done for us on the cross. And that's what we have to understand. If you've experienced that in your life, then you and I should be sharing that with other people. Why? Because that's how people understand this righteousness that God has given them. It's not that we just invite people to church because coming to church is not going to save you. It's not just that we talk about tithing because tithing is not going to save you. It's it's not about living right and trying treating other people good, and loving other people. It's not about all that kind of stuff because that stuff is not going to save you. It is the gospel that is going to save you. And the gospel is what Jesus has done for you on the cross. That's what we have to understand. And that's what we need to share with other people if you've experienced that. So today we're talking about different ways that we can share this gospel with other people. You don't have to have a seminary degree to share the gospel with other people. You don't even have to go to a Bible college like Washita or Williams. Both are good schools. Although I graduated from Washita, so I'm preferred. I have, you know, well, anyway, we won't go there. Both are good schools. You don't have to go to one of those Bible schools to be able to learn this. Because all you're doing is talking about what Jesus has done for you, the gospel. Because that's where the righteousness of God is revealed. So what has God done for you? I want to share with you different ways that we can share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to go through these pretty quickly today because I want us, these are notes that you can take. The biggest challenge for each and every one of us is to be able to just take the opportunity to share what Jesus has done for us. Every single one of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have a testimony, a story. Why? Because what did God do for you? When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, why? Why did you do that? And if you can explain why, then you can share the gospel of Jesus Christ. What did Jesus do for you? Well, he died for my sins. What did that do for you? Well, it saved me from separation from God. Why did he do that? Well, because God loves me. If you just answer simple questions like that, then you can share the gospel of Jesus Christ with whoever you have the opportunity to do that. And here's some ways to help with that. And I'm going to go through these. Um, three, different, three different steps that I have with us today that we're going to go through. The first one is just a very common one, Roman Road. We've looked at uh, these before. You've heard this before. This is just taking passages out of the book of Romans to be able to share what God has done for us. And here's the scriptures. In chapter 3, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. I'm sorry. 
For all have sinned. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us are sinners. And that's what we have to understand. In Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. The wages, the cost of our sin is death. Now, not a physical death. It's the separation from God because God cannot look upon sin. These are simple scripture that we can share to remind us of what God has done for us. Romans 5, 8, But in... But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The understanding of explaining what God's love is for each and every one of us. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, then we shall be saved. So through those simple scriptures, we can talk about who we are, that we are sinners, what has happened, that we're separated from God, what God did for us in his love, and what we need to do to receive that. That is a salvation experience that somebody can understand simply learning those scriptures. Now, that's simple. Now, let's talk about one other. Another form that we may can use, there's a lot of different techniques out there, is one I just want to introduce to you called faith. A lot of churches are doing this faith outreach, and there's a lot of things to that, but I just want to simply go through these things, faith, forsaking all in trusting him, this idea of what it means to share the gospel, so that you may be able to take these notes, learn these scriptures, and go. F is for forgiveness. In Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. The understanding of what forgiveness does for each and every one of us. A is available. In John three sixteen, it talks about that... Um, This is for all who will believe in Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that anyone, everyone, all who believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We have to understand that it's available to everybody, but it's not automatic. Because in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, it talks about this fact that Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. An understanding that somebody, it's available, but it's not automatic for everybody because we have to make the choice in ourselves. So forgiveness available. I is impossible. It's impossible for sin to enter heaven. We learn that through Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23, those verses that talk about what this separation that sin does with us and God, which leads us to turn, which is T, turn away from sin, as we're reminded in Luke chapter 13, verse 3, unless you repent, you too shall perish. Turn away from sin, turn to Christ. In Romans 10, 9, confess with your mouth and believe, as we've already read, that we turn to Christ. So this idea that we've been given forgiveness, that it's available, it's impossible for sin to enter heaven, so that we must turn from our sins and to Christ, then we're able to experience heaven, which is H, heaven. In John 10, 10, Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and may have it more abundantly, the understanding of what God has done for us. Now, that's just one simple, and I say simple. You may think, gosh, that's a lot of things to consider there. Well, we just need to remember those kind of things that, you know, faith, The word faith is an important part. Forsaking all, I trust him. How do we do that? By understanding the forgiveness we've been given, that it's available for everybody, that it's impossible for sin to enter heaven. That's why we must turn away from our sin and turn to Christ so that we may experience heaven and the promises that God gives us. If we continue to go over these things over and over and just practice, then we'll feel more comfortable to be able to talk about when somebody says, what does it mean to turn away from your sin? Well, that's repentance. That's what we've got to do is to turn away from that kind of stuff. So that's another method that we can use. I also want to share with you five steps. I know I'm going through these quickly, but this is why you're taking notes, right? Hopefully. Five steps of the gospel. Now, these five steps you're going to find in your Sunday school books if you attend one of our classes, especially in our children's literature. It's always written out in the back or the front cover, this idea of what these five steps of the gospel. And so you're going to continue. If you need things to look at, it's, you're going to find it in there. These are the five steps of the gospel, the concepts that help us to explain what the gospel really means to each and every one of us. The first one is, is that God rules. We have to understand that God's in control. Let me tell you this. This is one of the things that I really run into a lot of times when I'm sharing about the gospel in Jesus Christ. Because people will say, well, why do I, what if I don't believe in God? Because a lot of times people just don't understand who God is. 
That's why it's important for us to understand what it means to engage Jesus every day. Understanding that God is in control of all things, that he's the creator of all things. If you believe God created earth, then we need to live our lives to reflect that. So it's an understanding of trusting God that he is creator of all things. So God rules. The Bible tells us that God created everything. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, you are worthy Our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. We have to come to an understanding that God created all things. We've mentioned that in Genesis 1-1, that he created everything and we're talking about it in Revelations as well. God rules. The second thing that we have to understand is that we sin. We sin. We choose to disobey God. The Bible calls this sin. Sin separates us from God because he cannot look upon sin in all of his holiness. Is that because he turns his back on us? No. That's because he understands that sin is disobedience to what he created and designed. So if we believe God created everything, then we have to understand what sin does and that we sin. And we can use those verses out of Romans to explain that. So God rules. We sin. The third step is that God provided. God rules, we sin, God provided. God provided for a way. Even though sin separates us from God, God provided for a way to pay for that sin through Jesus Christ. And we look at scripture like John 3, 16. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 9, it says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one may boast. God has given us this gift provided to each and every one of us. And that's what we also need to understand. We see God, that God rules everything, that God created everything. We understand sin that it separates us, and that we understand that God provided a way for each and every one of us, provided a way to be reconciled to God, provided a way to be in a relationship with God. So God provided. What did God provide? This leads us to the fourth step. Jesus gives. Jesus gives. Jesus lived the perfect life on earth. He came out of heaven, given everything up to come on this earth, to live his life as an example of a reflection of who God is and the relationship that he had with God so that we also can have that relationship with God. Jesus went to the cross to pay for our sin, to die for us so that we might understand what it means to be forgiven and redeemed through his blood so that we might be able to enter into a relationship with God. Jesus gives himself for us as we read in Romans 5, 8, and another scripture that teaches us this concept. So God rules, sin, we have sin, God provided through Jesus because he gives his life, and the fifth step is we must respond. We must respond. How do you respond when you're given a gift? Do you receive it or do you reject it? We respond by believing in our heart that Jesus alone is the one who saves us, that he died on the cross We must also respond by repenting and turning away from our sin and our self as Scripture teaches us. This is why the verse in Romans 10, 9 and 10 reflects this whole response that we should have. That in Romans 10, 13, it also says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. An understanding that if someone is genuinely calling out to God to save them from this separation from him to be reconciled, Scripture teaches us then they will be saved and understand that. Now let me share with you a simple way of responding. How do you lead someone to respond? If someone comes up and says, I've never asked Jesus to be my Savior. If you remember these three things, you can lead them to an understanding of accepting Jesus as their Savior. It's as simple as this, A, B, C. The first thing we do, and we've learned this from day one in Sunday school and VBS, we admit that we are sinners. A lot of times what I will do with someone and say, because scripture teaches us that we need to confess with our mouth, declare with our mouth, we need to speak and say what we really believe. That's what scripture teaches. So that's what we must do. So we do the ABCs. We admit that we are sinners. We admit that we sinned against God, that sin separates us from God. But we also must believe, because Scripture teaches that not only confessing, but believing. We believe that Jesus died for our sin and that he rose again. Jesus did that. Not me, not my church attendance, not my church tithing, not me being good, not me just loving my neighbor, but Jesus died for my sin. And I believe that Jesus did that. I believe that God rose him from the grave, as Scripture teaches us. Then we confess, again, reflecting back to what Scripture teaches us. 
admitting that we're sinners, believing and confessing. When someone comes to the point when I've shared the gospel with them, I've talked about what Jesus did for them. I'll always say, do you want to respond to God? Because he's given, he's offering you a gift. Do you want to respond? And if they say yes, then I'll say, then we need to talk to God because that's all you need to do. And sometimes they'll say, I don't know how to talk to God. And I say, okay, well, then just repeat what I say. God, I'm sorry I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus died in my place because of his great love. I believe he rose again that I might have freedom. God, give me boldness to be able to obey you in everything that you're teaching me. God, thank you for saving me. Amen. And that's just the simple prayer of leading them through the ABCs. And then I'll say this. Go share with somebody. Because that's what God is asking you to do. That's what God is asking each and every one of us to do. To share. What Jesus has done for us. Now I know I've kind of went through this quickly. You've probably jotted down some notes. But here's the thing that I want you to take away. These are methods and these are things in Scripture that you can learn, you can read, you can memorize. Hey, there was one point in my life where I didn't know this stuff. And I had to just keep remembering. I had to keep memorizing, keep saying the Roman road to be able to know and to memorize what those Scriptures are. So that when someone asks, I'll be ready to share. But the most important thing, the most important thing that you can do is to talk about What Jesus did for you. It's as simple as that. What did Jesus do for you? If you can share that, then you're sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, which leads to the righteousness that God gives each and every one of us. And so our challenge this summer is that to learn a way that you can share. And I challenge each and every one of you to do that. To share what Jesus has done for you. That's one of the most important ways that you and I can engage others to share what Jesus has done. For some of us today, maybe you've never made that choice in your life. You've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've never really heard the gospel presented, even though quickly. You've never heard the gospel presented in that such a way. You've never understood it that way. And maybe what you need to do is respond to God. By saying, I need to pray and ask Jesus. We're going to give you an opportunity to do that. And if you pray to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then I'm going to ask you to come forward and to let us know and celebrate with you and to help walk that journey with you. If you've never been baptized before, the biggest thing is to obey what Jesus has done for us. He was baptized, and he calls all of us to be baptized, to associate what he has done for us, and to let other people know. Whatever you need to do, this is your opportunity to respond to God. Let's pray.